Meet Jerry Ostriker, astrophysicist, used to be at Princeton, now he's at Columbia University. He is an expert in dark matter, large-scale structure in the universe. Here's a book about the heart of darkness and dark matter, the fundamentals of structure in the universe, unsolved problems in astrophysics. He know, he's a cosmologist. He's given a lot of thought to whether there's life elsewhere in the universe. And I sat down with him in Hawaii and asked the question, are we alone, Jeremy? I'm Jerry Ostriker. I'm a theoretical astrophysicist. I don't use telescopes very much. And I've been to Princeton for a very long time, also at Cambridge, also now at Columbia. I'm working on galaxy formation with Thorsten Knob and other people. I'm working on black holes, how to make them, what do they do. Um, it's a pretty exciting and open subject, and the relation between those two, because it turns out that they influence how galaxies evolve. Now, one question, I, I think I saw this on, uh, oh, on a well, somebody said that the black hole is a singularity in space, and the black Big Bang was a singularity in time. Uh, and, and I ran across this in the context of, do we live inside of a black hole? How crazy or non-crazy an idea is that? <sighs> Where to begin? Where to Just begin? a second. Well, the simplest pictures of cosmology from Hubble before and after or we live in an infinite uniform medium universe. And so no matter where you were, it would always look the same at a given time. Black holes are not that way. They have a center. And you better watch out if you get too close to one. So they're topologically somewhat different, really. OK. And um, are we alone? I have been persuaded right from the beginning, from the Drake equation before and after that, that it's extremely unlikely that we're alone. That this, it's just, it would be like somebody waking up in bed and saying, am I the only human being in the universe? Well, even if they didn't have nobody lying next to them in bed, it's just unlikely <laughs> that something as complicated as that could just suddenly arise. And then whatever made it arise wouldn't arise someplace else. You always have to think you're really exceptional. So there's no basis for it. Now there's a much better basis, as you know, and as your audience knows, the Drake equation took a whole lot of things that we don't know anything about and multiplied the, uh, the probabilities together and got an answer. So at some level, it was completely cuckoo. But the first few pieces of it, um, how many stars there are, we know that much better. How many stars have planets? 20 years ago, we didn't know that. Now we know, on average, stars have planets. And we even know now a bit about what kinds of planets. And, so, and we even know that there's, that there's some which are in the right temperature zone. So a lot of the things which were pure speculation early on are now you know, good science. Um, and my guess is we'll know the other parts of it over time. Um, but the whole issue is a lot more complicated than the naive ways people went about thinking about it at the beginning. If we think about the other animals on the planet, some of them are a lot bigger than us, and some of them are a lot smaller than us, the bacteria, the viruses. If there's life out there, it, it's probably extraordinarily various. And if there's intelligent life, just think about the kids in your high school class, how varied they were. Mm -hmm. Well, the ones in the universe are going to be more varied than that. And one Even of the things, in the high school class? <laughs> and one of the things is some of the people in your high school class were nice and friendly, and, uh -huh. and some of them were really nasty, and some of them were outgoing, and some of them were extremely shy. And so my guess is <clears throat> that the life in our galaxy will have the whole spectrum of characteristics that they could have. Now let's think of what that means. Suppose some of them are a little nasty. Well, OK, suppose a smaller fraction are really nasty and paranoid. Well, if they see life developing out there, those particular ones, and they may be only one in a billion. They say, you know, 
they have just gotten communications and radio, but it's not going to be too long before they've developed all kinds of high technology. And then they may be friendly or they may not be friendly. Let's zap them beforehand and knock them off. Well, let's suppose there are just a small number of such uh, critters in the galaxy. Well, if that's the case, then signals, when our signals get across the galaxy, whoever they are will have seen them. Well, we've had radio and TV and things like that for hundreds of years. We've had fires, which you probably can't tell from natural wildfires um, for thousands of years. So at most, our signals have gone a few hundred uh, light years away. But when they've gone 10,000 light years, we'd better watch out. And it may be that all of the nice civilizations have gotten wiped out by the, the small number of nasties. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we don't see them is they were waving and saying, hi there, <laughs> have a nice day, until somebody went bang. And so it, that's a solution to the Fermi paradox. And if it is this, that the reason why we don't see a lot is not that they weren't there, but that the small number of nasties killed them. If you look, and Hawaii is not a bad example, um, if you invite in some alien creatures who are more developed than you are, the odds are pretty good that they're going to be nasty to you.